Happy New Year, everyone. This video is going to be a little bit different than the past ones. I'm basically going to be sharing a story with you, a shipwreck story. And this story, for me, started out in a bar, as all good stories should start out. And I was talking to a commercial fisherman friend of mine who told me about this shipwreck he knew that would probably be of interest to me. So looking over some of the GoPro video that he shot, because he's a, a deep water commercial spear fisherman, it was immediately obvious to me this was a unique shipwreck. This was not a, a broken down trawler or a barge. This was special. On our first dive to the site, we wanted to get an idea of the layout uh, and try to pick out some unique features. And we did see a pair of railroad style boilers, a very archaic engine laying on its side, and obviously the side wheel paddle hubs. One of the most abundant features of this wreck site are bottles, lots of bottles. And we picked out a few to try to figure out what kind of cargo this vessel was carrying because that would help provide a clue to the identity of this shipwreck. And as we picked up probably the most abundant bottle type, we found out it was a Bordeaux style bottle. And a few of the corks actually, you could actually make out the stamping on the cork that they were that intact and that well preserved. And it was obvious it was J.L. Durette, which is a fine olive oil maker from France, Bordeaux. As I researched this shipwreck using some of the clues we found on the wreck, one of the vessels that came to my attention was a, a sidewheel steamer called the Black Joker, or as she was originally known, the Sea Vanderbilt, when she was built in 1838 in New York City. In my pursuit for a shipwreck identity, it's taken me all over the place, from New Orleans, Louisiana, Charleston, South Carolina, and also to Cuba. Cuba. I mean, who does that? It's crazy to, you know, for a shipwreck. So the reason for going to Charleston was because after a few years of serving as a ferry in the New York area, Cornelius Vanderbilt leased his vessel out to a friend of his in the Carolinas. This was basically used by the Wilmington Railroad Company, serving between Wilmington and Charleston, South Carolina. So Charleston was a major destination for this vessel. So I went there looking for archival newspaper articles and background information about the vessel. Maybe. Uh, an old picture that was in the archive somewhere. So I wanted to get a better idea of this vessel and its, and its background. The reason for going to Havana was because after she served as a packet steamer between Wilmington and Charleston, she was sold to a New Orleans businessman. And he basically put it in the employ of support of the Confederacy at the opening of the Civil War. Even though she changed her name from the Sea Vanderbilt to the Black Hawk and eventually to the Black Joker, Everyone knew these were aliases, uh, basically trying to hide her true identity as a Confederate blockade runner. Blockade running was basically bootlegging. This activity was so lucrative, they could basically arrange for the construction of a new vessel and pay for the crew for an entire year from the proceeds of one trip. And after that, every single trip, all income was just gravy. It was all pure profit. That was the reason for why they would do this. It wasn't always about their alliances with the Confederacy. This, this was a business, a very good business. During the Civil War, the U.S. Navy set up blockades around southern ports in an attempt to restrict trade and choke off the Confederacy. With no true Navy of its own, the Confederacy depended on a fleet of improvised vessels for defense, as well as private ships to run the blockade and bring in much needed supplies. The mechanics of blockade running were fairly simple and depended on one highly desirable commodity, cotton. As such, cotton became the lifeblood of the Confederacy. Blockade runners would purchase cotton for pennies per pound in the South, sell it for astronomical profits in a foreign port, and use those proceeds to then purchase arms, ammunition, and supplies for the Confederacy. As a blockade runner, they were required to carry 50% of the cargo in support of the war effort. The other 50%, however, would consist of other scarce and highly profitable items such as liquor, coffee, and medicine. This was all contingent on a blockade runner eluding the U.S. Navy and making it into a safe southern port, but in doing so, a successful run would yield profits of 300 to 500 percent. After doing numerous dives on the site over the years, it became apparent to me that there's something missing. This was not the entire shipwreck. So with that premise in mind, we began exploring other sites within 15-20 miles of this wreck site. We had a couple of sites we wanted to check out, and one turned out to be quite fascinating, and indeed this had uh, more cargo, more bottles, and, and more importantly, we found the, the remains of the rudder. Uh, again, this was not an entire shipwreck, so I feel strongly this was associated with the bottle wreck that we've been diving for years. 
So with this other rec site, we feel that we have a tangible clue to help identify what the main bottle rack might be. This clearly looks like it's a portion of the main rec, and the cargo is consistent with what we found on the primary site, all these bottles that date at the same time. And we did find some very compelling evidence to help date and identify this shipwreck. But I'm going to share that with you at a later time in a second video. I hope you'll check in. So again, I'm going to remind you to please uh, subscribe, like this video, and share it with your friends. And we'll get some more videos out to you in the very near future. Thanks a lot.